In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father God, we praise and thank you for this opportunity to bring our gift to you, offerings of our God. We just pray that you'll take them and use them to your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I've, I've just been reminded in actual fact that uh, we neglected to announce the, the funeral for Joyce which is 12.15, I think I'm right in saying tomorrow. And uh, we just have to spend uh, not quite sure what time she was going to go in. Quarter past one at the crematorium. Half past one at the crematorium. Uh, at service here at quarter past twelve. And then there uh, is refreshments after the cremation back at the church. Um, as the children go, let's just pray for the children. 
Father God, we just pray for our children as they go to the group and as they prepare for the nativity service. We just pray that you'll give them encouragement and guidance and help them to understand the importance of this message for them. And we just pray too for the adults as we remain in the church, that you will speak to us too through the reading of the word and uh, through uh, the, the preaching of the sermon. Lord, we just commend our service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The children would like to go. Love came down at Christmas. That's what the story is all about. Love came down at Christmas. Love, all oh, lovely. Love divine. We've got to sing a 376 in Tongues of Coach.
And the second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 22 to 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. This is the word of the Lord. I was going to say that uh, you won't know this next hymn unless you're a Baptist. But then I discovered the Baptist members of the choir didn't know it either. <laughs> so it's a fresh one. It's a hymn about prayer. It takes from the Baptist uh, Praise and Worship book, which is now I know. It's a simple prayer. It's just two lines. It's a prayerful one, a thoughtful one. And I'm going to suggest that you just remain seated as, as we sing this. Um, as a gentle prayer, leading into... Uh, the prayers of intercession, which this morning are going to be led by finally. Prayer to a heart of lowly love. <laughs> experiencing tropical storms which have taken hundreds of lives and people's homes. We pray for the families finding it hard to feed themselves and for people living in the streets. Pray that something good will happen for them soon, especially around this Christmas period. Lord, we, we like to say thank you for the kind actions of the nine-year-old girl who this week left treats and kind messages for numerous emergency services. Lord, we pray for the Lord, for the people who lost their lives and others in hospital in the fire in the factory in Bella in the early hours of this morning. There is a lot of sadness and wrongdoing in this world, but fortunately there are no good deeds and actions take place, for which we are thankful. One of these was to the people this week who took themselves away from their own comforts on Thursday night to sleep out to raise money for the homeless. And we remember in our prayers 
people nod to us who need your love and guiding hand, Lord. We think of Marjorie and her family at this very sad time, and also of Dorothy and Bill, Bill who is in the hospice. We, we bring all their problems to you. Amen. Thank you. As I was uh, sitting there looking at the stream and the street, and I have to commend Peter for his pictures that went with the words, the verses there. You know, that one, turn one, two, Peter, that put all together. I think we, we all preach a great debt for the way he enables us to lead worship together. We sing again a hymn that proclaims the fact that God is with us. Emmanuel, O Emmanuel. <coughs> should go round the churches, the houses in the immediate vicinity of the church. And we couple with that also the, the put on the back of it, the uh, invitation for people to request prayers. And uh, on this occasion, in actual fact, each uh, street, there are 10 streets altogether this time, 469 leaflets, and uh, I know there are some very faithful people who deliver the normal prayer letters, and some have already picked up bundles. So I'd be very grateful if after the service you pick up a bundle from one of the streets and deliver them. The uh, notice gives notices for next Sunday, the Young People's Nativity Service, the Carol's Christmas Day Service uh, as well. So that's important that that goes out this week, and I've got to entangle this now. 
and whatever. Um, and that's my sermon on the floor. <laughs> it sounds going, it sounds going about an experience of having a sermon notes in the wrong order. Can be very confusing. Right, we'll get sorted. Um, as you know, we, um, we were away, some of you know, that we were away in Abu Dhabi uh, a couple of weeks ago. Our daughter lives out in Abu Dhabi. And uh, if there's one thing that sort of worries me about the Muslims, it's not uh, the extremists who cause trouble on Tower Bridge or whatever, but their prayer power. Every morning at 6.50, my daughter lives about 100 yards from one mosque, in one direction, a hundred yards from another mosque in another direction, and I think there's a third mosque which is about 200 yards away. And about 6.15 in the morning, we're awakened with the call to prayer. And then at 12.15, as we're having lunch, there's another call to prayer. One at 3.15 in the afternoon, and one at 6.15 uh, in the evening. And you see the men, not the women, but the men going to pray on each occasion. Sadhu Sundar Singh, who was a Hindu, converted to Christianity, became an evangelist, talks about his sister, who was still a Hindu. And he says this about her. She wakes each morning at early dawn to perform her devotions and to keep her religious observances. And he went on to say, I compare her to others in Christian homes who spend five minutes and then are tired, but who hope to spend all eternity in praising God. See that Muslims and Hindus place much more uh, attention to their prayers than many Christians. That's what Sundar Singh is suggesting. And yet Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. And we don't always take that comment seriously. We continue to continue to do our own thing in our own way in our own, with our own abilities. And when we don't pray, what we're really saying to God is, it, it's all right, Lord, we can manage quite well on our own, thank you. Instead of going, recognising our need of him. Oswald Chambers, who's a writer I've quoted many times and I read regularly, he was a, a Bible uh, teacher uh, about a hundred years ago, said, as long as we are rich, Possessed of anything in the way of pride or independence, God cannot do anything for us. If there's one unforgivable sin, it must be complacency. And the reason it's an unforgivable sin is because the complacent person won't recognise where they're going wrong and will not seek forgiveness. That's why it's unforgivable. As James put it, when that happens, because of our complacency, God cannot do anything for us. I've often been accused of uh, seeing things from a negative point of view. Of being critical of, of people and, and situations. When I look at that, there's a, in, in the vestibule, you know, there's a, a picture of all our past churches the Baptist churches, the Methodist churches that have come to make up this church. I seem to remember there's about 20. That picture presents a collage of failures. Those buildings were built to evangelise Burnley. They were built to expand the kingdom of God. They were built with the intention of growing. But instead, Satan has picked them up, one by one. How? Why? And the Bible is the answer. For now, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let me read that again. Our opposition against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil 
in its heavenly realm. Do we recognize that? That that's what we're up against. And I share the same sadness that you share about your churches. Because my home church in Rotherham also closed. And I look back at that church and I think, where did we go wrong? Did we do the things that we wanted to do in the way we wanted to do it? And did we rely on ourselves? Although I was only a teenager when I was a sort of a big part of the church, a member of the church, I look back and I think, how much did we pray? And yet Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. We pay tribute to Jesus in our hymns. We pay tribute to Jesus in our worship. But what about our work for him? What about our mission for him? Do we rely on ourselves instead of Jesus? And the Bible says, unless the Lord does the house, those who labor, labor in vain. I don't believe in the devil with horns and a trident and a tail or with a red suit. But I do believe in the existence of evil forces in our world both human and spiritual. Things that attack the Lord's people and through them, the churches. Have you ever come across a book called Screwtape Letters? Yeah. Uh, read it, if you haven't read it before. Screwtape Letters is an act of fiction. It's a story of a senior devil advising the junior devil how to corrupt a new convert. And you read it, it's by C.S. Lewis, did the Narnia story. And you read it and you think, hang on, this is supposed to be fiction. But I recognise the truth of that. And I recognise the truth of that. And I recognise the truth of that. The way in which Satan, if you want, or evil forces try to drag us down. And so the Bible encourages us. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. You know that passage about the full armour of God? We normally apply it to individual Christian lives. But what it also applies to a corporate body, to corporate Christian lives, to the body of Christ, to the church. And it goes on and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Somehow, our church has failed for not taking account of the opposition. They failed because they failed to recognize their own weaknesses and their own vulnerability. And when advised, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Lord. And Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Many, what he meant was, it's when I recognize my weakness and seek help from the Lord that I discover where my strength is. When he was about 20 or 21, my younger brother Bob uh, bought, uh, I think he's either an MGA or an MGB sports car. I think we had a Reliant at the time, but that, that we had. <laughs> and um, he had problems with the car, and he decided he'd do it himself. And my dad tried to give him some advice, but no, no, he was going to do it himself. So he started to strip it down. I don't know how far he got with it. Well, I know he didn't solve the problem, and he made it worse, and in the end he went back to my dad. And my dad had a look at it, and my dad decided the best thing to do was to take the car to the garage. So I don't know whether he told it or it went on a truck or not, because I was in college at the time. My dad never told us how much it cost him to get that car repaired. My brother tried to do it all in himself, and in the end, he had to seek father's help. What do you like to shopping? 
I'm a shocker. Janet said to me, can you go into B&M and get some? So and I'm going to B&M and I'll wander up down the aisles and I'll come out. I can't find it, I haven't got any. <clears throat> so Janet will go in, she won't wander up down the aisles, she'll look at the assistant and say, can you tell me where so-and-so is? And of course they'll go straight to it. I hate asking for help in shops. I am told it's a man thing. Are there many that are the same as me? Good, I'm glad we want to do at least. I, I didn't ask you what I said to me. And you know, the trend is sometimes we like that with prayer. We don't ask for help when we need it. We try to do it on our own. And it can happen with the church. We're determined we'll do it our way. And we're not ready to acknowledge before the Lord, I need the help. You'll have seen in the magazine that we've set the morning of New Year's Day aside as a day of prayer. You'll see that notice going on. I have to come in surely again. That is brilliant. Um, church will be open from 10 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock noon. And we're going to have a short communion service about uh, quarter to 12 just to finish it off. It's an opportunity for people to come and sit and quiet after the rush of Christmas. It's something we used to do uh, in, in my churches when I was in ministry. We set New Year's Day aside so that people could come and go, come for 10 minutes, an hour, whatever they like. For security purpose that I should be here uh, and also using that as a time of prayer and retreat for myself. It's an opportunity an opportunity to find stillness after that busy Christmas period. It's an opportunity to reflect on last year, to give thanks for good experiences, to confess perhaps those difficult experiences or failures in the past, and discover God's forgiveness and peace. It's an opportunity to pray for the coming year, to commit those special moments of joy and happiness that are going to happen or ask for strength for difficult moments that might be coming ahead. Tests, treatment, operations, bereavement. It's an opportunity to commit oneself to the Lord, to discern the ways in which God might want to use us. At the beginning of January, we'll be having a covenant service. But this is more personal, personal than a formal covenant service. You'll see the words on the screen, you'll read the words out. But he will be thinking in the stillness and in the quietness. It's an opportunity to pray for the church, to seek God's guidance for our future, to ask for his help, not for what we want to do, but for what he wants us to do. to discover just what he wants to do through us. We have a very good prayer meeting, meets once a fortnight on a Monday night. And we, we pray for the sick, we pray for the lonely, we occasionally pray for politicians. But what troubles me is that we very, very rarely seem to pray for the church or its witness, or its work. Some of them might say I'm wrong, but that's just how it seems to me, for me. We need to pray for a new vision, for the future of the church. The vision team are, are they preparing a new uh, motto, or have they done it? No, we are, in the process. In the process of, uh, of planning a new vision statement, a new vision motto. We need to pray for the energy and commitment to fulfill that vision. We need to pray for new members, for new families. We need to pray for new musicians and worship leaders. We're down to two pianists now, very good pianists, but neither of them are well. We need to pray for the various sections of the church. Some of whom seem to be smaller in numbers, some of whom leaders 
are feeling tired and want to find somebody else to take responsibility. So many things that we need to pray for, and you can probably think of many others. But we need to remember, it's not our church. It's the Lord's church. This is the body of Christ here in Brightly Fraud. And we're here to fulfill the work of reconciliation that he died for. We are here to embody his love. And we're here to try and bring hope and life to the lost and the dying in this area. Christ died on the cross to bring salvation to lost souls. And he chose the church as an instrument to spread the news. So how are we getting on fulfilling our roles? Jenna tells me I've told you this story before, and she's got a better memory than I have. David Pringle was a lecturer at Manchester University. And he felt that God was calling him to be pastor of a small church in South Manchester. A place called Pointer. So he wrote a letter to the church uh, saying what he felt God wanted him to do. But he didn't hear anything. So he wrote again and still didn't hear anything. So he was so convinced that this was what God was calling him for uh, that he decided he'd go on down and visit the church one night. And according to the story, he found six old ladies sitting around the pot-bellied stove praying. Well, it was actually a pot-bellied stove, but not, I don't know, but that's the story. And when he told them what he'd come for, they said, we have been praying for somebody like you. When he met the church secretary, the church secretary explained, he hadn't replied because he thought it was a hoax. So he went as pastor to that church, and gradually it grew. I uh, met one of the members of that church some, uh, some years ago who said it's amazing how God bring, tried to bring people into the church, use them for a period, and then took them away again. And he had been one of these people who had been there. That church grew. It became one of the largest Baptist churches in South Manchester. It is still one of the largest churches in South Manchester. When we were in Thameside, Janet and I used to love sometimes on a Sunday night to go down to their evening service. All because there were six old ladies praying for new leadership in that church. Ken said something, Ken Hare said something at our Bible study the other week, and I, I, I've asked him what it was because I, I can vaguely remember it, but he couldn't remember it. But it was quite profound. I said, stop, made me stop and think. He said, what if people don't believe in prayer? I never thought of that. I thought all Christians believed in prayer. And perhaps I'm wrong. Because the question I often ask is, does God answer prayer? Yes. But not always in the way that we want. I was going to quote some examples of the way we've gone and worked in our life and answered our prayers. I was going to talk about possibly how Tim nearly lost uh, one of his fingers through gangrene and how God answered prayers. I was going to talk about the time that we got stranded in the middle of Cornwall, out of petrol, on Christmas Day, and there are no petrol stations open on Christmas Day. Or I was going to talk about the time that uh, we were in Romania uh, at Bucharest Airport, and uh, thought we hired a car and we couldn't get it. They wouldn't let us have it because they hadn't got the documentation. Uh, but they were all sold by prayer. If I were asked for people to stand up and come and speak to the front of that evidence that they've got of how God has answered prayer in their life, they'd probably be accused. People wanted to give their testimony. Have you seen that story this week of Laura Cole? The little girl, six-year-old girl, was made a recording of um, when a child is born. And apparently it is now top of the Amazon download list for those who don't understand 
uh, they keep a record of those people that download music off the, off the internet and sort of uh, and, and, and buy it. She is top, or second or top. Six year old. She's doing it to raise money. She had a brain tumor just after she was born. And so she's singing to raise money for brain tumor research. When we were in South Wales, we had a similar situation. We had a little girl in the village who had a brain tumor when she was uh, only a baby. Uh, this happened just before we arrived in Wales, but we saw the consequences. So the people in the village from the churches, the Baptist Methodist and an Anglican church, decided they would meet on the Monday morning at 10 o'clock when she was having her operation. And so they met, and she recovered from the operation. And that prayer meeting continued on a Monday morning at 10 o'clock for years. It was all our time uh, down there. We were there 11 years and it continued after we left. Her name was Joanne. Very popular little girl uh, in the Sunday school and in the church where she grew up. She lived to be 40, in her 40s, when she died of a stroke. But if you would have asked anybody in the village or in the church, did they believe that God answers prayers, they would have pointed to Joanne. God does answer prayers. But then there's the other side of it. As you know, our son Tim uh, lost his wife Jackie through breast, uh, through breast cancer when they'd only been married 10 years. Tim and Jackie were members of the Baptist Alliance of Youth, Alliance of Baptist Youth, which meant that they had got friends all over the country. They were all praying for Jackie. Uh, they got their churches praying for Jackie. We were praying for Jackie. But Jackie died. It uh, had a devastating effect on our faith, Janet and myself, and uh, quite a few others. Because God didn't answer our prayers as we wanted. And if I ask people to put their hand up or come stand at the front and give a testimony of the fact how they feel that God let them down, there'd probably be another cue. Because that's how we feel sometimes. But also they might testify how God saw them through the crisis and we know that the way that Tim was able to bring up his two children, five and two, when the mother died. How um, God helped him through that situation and then eventually brought him and Tracy together. The people have difficulty believing in prayer because of disappointing experiences. I can understand if they do. But I can't offer an intellectual answer because when people ask why, they're asking an emotional question. And an emotional, uh, intellectual answer won't survive. Some people are able to talk about how their prayers or other people's prayers help them to cope through a difficult situation. And as a pastor, I learned not to look at people's situations from the outside to try and offer glib answers or meaningless words of comfort or some apparently appropriate word from Scripture. I learned to listen to what they were saying about their experience of God. To speak about the help that they were getting. And I wouldn't try to cheer them up. Sometimes I'd cry with them. And when God sees the pain of his people, I believe he cries with them too. One of the members down in South Wales told me he was visiting his son in hospital who was dying. And he commented to a nurse, it's very difficult to watch your son dying. And the nurse said, how do you think God felt watching his son dying? <laughs> it's, I think, the most important day in the Christian calendar is Christmas. If there had been no Christmas, there would have been no Easter. 
Without God coming in a form, in a human form, in Jesus, there would have been no crucifixion, there would have been no atonement, there would have been no resurrection, there would have been no eternal life for you and me. We've just sung Emmanuel, which means God with us. Remember that line, sharing my humanness, my shame, feeling my weakness, my pain, taking the punishment, the blame. Emmanuel. God is with us. God said to the psalmist, be still and know that I am God. Some people are never still. Some people are never silent. Richard Foster writing uh, on the, in his book uh, about simplicity says, you know, when you're praying, don't just do something, sit there. Don't just do something. Sit there. Sit. Wait. Pray. New Year's Day gives us the opportunity to do just that. For ten minutes to come into the stillness of the chapel and sit and be still and wait upon the Lord. To experience his presence. To bring yourself before him. To bring your, your past before him, if necessary, but also to bring your present and to bring your future. And to bring our church before him. Perhaps our past, but especially our present and our future. We need to concentrate on the future. Because in our personal life, our sins, our failures, our mistakes, they're all forgiven, they're all dead and buried. You could say to the Baptist, they're all drowned. But the question is, what does Jesus want with us today and tomorrow? In our church, the past is also over and done with. Precious as those memories are. But the question that we want to ask the Lord is what are your plans for our future and Lord give us the guidance to follow your future the strength to fulfill your work the wisdom we need to fulfill what you want to do in our lives I didn't pick the hand to finish off with but we could have done take my life and let it be consecrated Lord today May that be our motto for the new year. Let's pray. Father God, you give us the space, you give us the time, you give us the fitness, you give us the opportunity to come and pray to you here or anywhere, in the building or in the open fields. You welcome our prayers. You don't need us to tell us, to tell you what we want or what we need or who we're praying for because you know already but we need to bring it before you. Because we want to share in your word and share in your work through this thing that you've given us. So Lord, we would pray. We would ask. Lord, teach us how to pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Our final hymn is a hymn that you all know very well. But unless you were around in 1965, you won't know the tune. We're going to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, to the tune The Carnival is Over, which in 1965 was recorded by who? I don't think anybody's a note there. The Seekers. So good. You know the tune. You've got off to a good start. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. <laughs>
invisibly gripes together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.